Are you working on something new? No. That is not like you, George. Welcome to Putting Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. We've come to a very big episode here. We are at Move On, a song that is considered by a great many people to be one of the best songs that Stephen Sondheim has ever written. I have a really great conversation with Shoshana Greenberg coming up here, but first, I wanted to read an email that I got here this past week sent in by Alex. This is in response to last week's episode on lesson number eight. And he pointed out two things that he wanted to bring up. So he writes, first, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that learning to read was so important to Dot that she named her daughter after one of the names in the primer. It's a little confusing because the song goes from George reading the name Marie to singing to his own grandmother. But based on the quotation marks and look I made a hat, only the first two instances of the name are being read from the primer. This is a really great thing to call out. This is something I was going to bring up last week, but failed to do so. So I think this is valuable stuff to to bring up. The Yes, this primer, learning to read, concentrating on these lessons was something that was greatly important to the character of Dot and something that carries over into move on. Now we move on to the second thing. So Alex writes, the second thing is that you commented on how strange it was that the primer is in English. It could indeed just be part of the conceit of the show that the French is magically being translated for our ears to hear as in act one. However, I've always thought of it as George practicing his very rudimentary French by translating what is written. The lines he's reading are short phrases with pauses in between, like he's translating three to four words and then pausing to read the next phrase. For me, this is further supported in the finale when he's reading Sarah's words slowly and has to ask Dot to help him with the last word because he cannot read the word. Possibly a combination of unfamiliarity with the language, making it harder to intuit what her poor handwriting says. Now, this may or may not hold up since the French word for harmony would just be harmony spelt with an I-E at the end, or harmony probably is how you would pronounce that. Uh, But that's just how it always struck me. So what do people out there think? I think this is actually a pretty astute observation on Alex's part that this might be him subtly sometimes communicating he's translating French back into English. But uh, I would love to hear what everybody else's thoughts are on that matter. Another thing I wanted to announce here at the beginning of this week's episode is what to expect from this show over the next couple of months. Um, I have to be very honest and say that I am getting increasingly burnt out based on a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in my personal life and trying to upkeep this podcast. So I'm making the announcement here right now that I am essentially taking all of September off. There'll still be a Sondheim adjacent episode that's recorded and released, but otherwise the main episodes are not going to be released in September. And then we'll renew back in October with the new season on Into the Woods, as well as some bonus stuff because of, you know, the trip that I'm taking to New York City and all that good stuff. But I thought instead of overworking myself, stressing myself out, and, you know, having a mental breakdown, it might be better to just, like, pump the brakes for just a month, step back, reorganize my thoughts, and then come back stronger than ever in October. So just so that people know that that is what's going to happen. Secondly, I mentioned this here a couple weeks ago, but yes, there is going to be a meetup of sorts before I go and see the last Sondheim show. Here we are, uh, somewhere around the shed. Uh, Those fine details are being... uh, discussed here at this point uh somebody did reach out and let me know that there's some really great meeting spots pretty close to there so i'm going to take a look at it see what makes the most sense uh, and then announce it i'll try to announce it here on the podcast but especially again if you follow me on instagram or on on x i guess now you'll see those updates over there as well so those are the announcements let's get into this week's episode i have nothing to say that many things well, nothing that's not been said. Said by you, though, I George. do not know where to go. And nor did I. I want to make things that count. Things that I did what I new. had to do. What am I to do? Move on. Trishana Greenberg, thank you so much for coming back. I am so excited to be back. And I'm so excited to be talking about this show. One of my favorites. Well, let's jump right into that here then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is Sunday in the Park with George. Do you remember 
the very first time you were introduced to Sunday in the Park with George. Yeah. So I, well, I was a big Into the Woods fan as mm-hmm. the child and we had them taped uh, from TV. This was the 90s. So they were basically on VHS tapes, like not even like ones you buy. Like my parents had literally taped them <laughs> from TV. <laughs> right, right when they were on um so they had this and they had sunday in the park with george but and they would tell me like oh you like into the woods there's this other show but i don't think i was ready for it yet when i was into into the woods because that's when i was like eight Mm -hmm. (laughs) so in high school i started getting into other sondheim shows so i watched it finally and i just completely fell in love with it this was around age like 15 Do you know why at age 15 it spoke to you? Like, was there something specific? I think it really just spoke to my teenage angst. (laughs) I think that there's something about it because it's so full of artist angst. And I wasn't like an artist at that point, but I'm sure I had like an artistic temperament and I like felt very artistic and wrote and did a lot of artistic stuff. Uh, But even just, I don't know. It just really spoke to my to my teenage angst. Like, ugh, why do you insist that you can't hear the words? Like, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> but all the all the stuff about artistic stuff, I guess, because I was gonna be an artist like that, that really spoke to me. So I think a combination of those things. I think too, there's something, I don't know, alchemical about this. I think of musical theater in general. You know, big emotions, you know, like Bernadette Peters, like like bleeding from her heart mm-hmm. or like old games singing songs. And it's just like, yes, as a as a 15 year old, I totally get you. <laughs> There's just yeah. something weird that there is a connection there. And I also I did have a sense that I didn't fully understand or didn't fully, fully get everything in this show, but that it was something that I would grow with. And I think I got that sense at 15 also and that was really cool to me that musical theater could be uh, like could be this piece of art that could that you could change with um and that was really exciting to me i I brought that up in uh i guess it would be the last week's episode in last week's episode i I talk about that that there are these pieces of art they think that you encounter where it's like oh I'm going to love like growing into this. I, I know that there's something here that I need to hear and that I'm going to love as I grow older. Contrasted with those pieces of art was like, I don't get this. And I don't think I want to get this. Like there, <laughs> those are two separate emotions. And for me, sometimes was always like, I don't quite get this emotion that they're talking about, but I yeah. want to. And, I'm, and I know I'm going to get there someday. Right. We have had many conversations here this season about the like first act versus the second act. So the question I am asking every single person is this, I don't know, debate, which on this show has not really been a, a debate, but <laughs> that uh, some people believe that you don't need the second act to be in this show at all, that everything is said within the first. I don't know how you would respond to that question. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny because of, uh, before I answer that, I will say a friend of mine went to see one of the revivals i think it was like Mm -hmm. the one in 2007 2008 and she left at intermission and i was like why why would you do that and she said well i think i knew where it was going like i think i i got it and she was like well what does happen in the second act and i was like oh well it it actually is 100 years later it's you know modern day all this stuff happens and she was like oh that's not where i thought it was going no (laughs) no not at all (laughs) but so I mean, I do. Yes. Like you do need the second act to tell the story that they wanted to tell. They're not telling that story in the first act. But I will say that as I think about it, I do kind of prefer the first act personally. I think when I was younger, I definitely prefer the first act with like some exceptions, but of scenes that I liked in the lines that I liked in the second act. I did get a little sad when we left that world in the first act so i Mm -hmm. i don't blame people i guess for if they think the first act is totally like i I think i've come i've come to this opinion that i totally understand the people who are like kind of bounce off the second act a little bit where it's like well this isn't really the story i was in right it's it's doing a very avant-garde thing jumping ahead of 100 years etc etc i think taking it 
as it is, though, I think there is this emotion that gets brought up. But again, you have to really get into the metaphysical here because it's not the same George. It's right. a ghost dot that shows up for kind of just some reason. There's not even like yeah. a magic spell or something that actually brings her into the present mm -hmm. sort of thing. They're really talking about all these lofty ideals very forcefully, very emotionally. And if it's like, you know what? I'm not really into these characters. I could totally understand what, where people would be like, yeah, you know what? And I'm okay with this. Some people just like like a linear, like mm -hmm. a, a linear story that is not going to get really heady <laughs> yeah. for them. Some people prefer that. So I, I get it. But I think you need the second act to tell the story of Sunday in the Park with George. Correct. The first act is the story of the painting or however you want to describe it. But yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. And I think actually, like, I really appreciated the recent revival and like in 2017 because I Jake felt like Hall one yeah because I felt like it really to me it really made a case for the second act to me mm. um in just the way? way it just the way it was directed I felt really interested I actually because I was watching parts of it because because it, <laughs> it's on YouTube uh to refresh my memory but I actually think that Jake Gyllenhaal does a really great job with modern contemporary George in yeah. that uh, more so than I liked his George in the first act. And actually, there's more so than I kind of like Mandy Patinkin's <laughs> contemporary oh, George. There, are, But also like some directorial choices that I thought really brought the second act to life for me in certain ways. Just like things in like the putting it together scene where like mm -hmm. they're just it, all the characters feel a lot warmer. Like there's a lot for of sure. like warmer interactions going on with George and the characters. The composer character is like just much more present. She ha like there. She has a daughter. They take the child from the first act and they make her her daughter, which right. I thought was really cool. Who and she also the daughter. The daughter also sings. Art isn't easy. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just just little little choices that I thought Sarno Lapine made in that re uh, revival that just really changed a lot about how I saw. The second act, like, in ter especially in terms of like the women in the second act being a lot more present, including Dot. Yeah, I, I think too. We we've had short conversations about this with other guests of um, how you decide to twin the characters because that mm -hmm. is not the same in every production either. Right. So I think you, yeah, you can be kind of interesting, like in the, this last revival, as you're saying, like you can do some interesting things by how you choose to place them. And then what right. roles you place them in. Yeah. Like, I think some are pretty fixed, but yeah. there's a lot like, like the mother is usually always the critic. The critic. Yeah. I mean, obviously Dot becomes Marie, <laughs> but like, I think everything else, like I don't even register who was who, you know, because mm -hmm. they look so different. Just talking about the the Jake Gyllenhaal of it all. I don't know why this popped into my head, <laughs> but uh, I just heard this. There's a term and now I can't remember what the term is, but it is uh, how some actors don't fit in period pieces mm. because they have faces they're like you've seen an iphone like there's <laughs> just something about their face <laughs> that's it's like i don't tr i don't buy that you're living in this like old timey place <laughs> i don't know if jake Hall falls into that category but yeah. maybe that's why it I bounces off of I mean, the I think, old one i think i really thought like now having like i really like watched scenes side by side as i was yeah. <laughs> preparing for this but i think it, for me Mandy Patinkin brought a lot of humanity to first act George that I haven't seen of the two other revivals I've seen. I haven't seen, you know, uh, certain, I agree with like, that. some of the other Georges come off very angry in that yeah. first act. Well, it's yeah. like little things like he smiles and Mandy Patinkin will smile sometimes uh, mm -hmm. in the first act, like right. briefly, but you see it, you know, and it's like, just little things like that where, I don't know, brings a little more humanity to that character. For sure. To quote uh, the critic, doesn't she say like it brought a certain humanity to see your yeah. mother up there? That's right. That's, <laughs> that's, right. How, that's <laughs> how I feel about um, George. <laughs> Hi everyone, just Kyle breaking into the conversation to tell you about some of the people that help this show continue to go. Now, of course, if you'd like to help support this show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review in whatever app you listen to podcasts in. That's 
of course, greatly appreciated. Because Putting It Together is an independent podcast, you can also help monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, by going over to the Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. I also need to give a huge thank you to the God That's a Good tier of Barry, Derek, Alex, Christopher G, Christopher L, Jack, Luis, Mike, Robert, Stephen, Todd, and Witty. All right, let's get back to the show. So what song are we talking about here today? So we are talking about Move On, the climactic number in the second act. I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with me, but I'm just going to throw it out there. I feel like this song is like one of the big ones. This is one of like a lot of people's favorite songs Sondheim has ever written. So first (laughs) off, do you even do you disagree with that base statement? I mean, I know a lot of people like this song Mm -hmm. and I think as a teenager, I Mm -hmm. was really into this song because it has so much it has so many like great lines about art and like how to be an artist how to how to be an artist and make art so i really related to those i think now as i as i've grown with the piece as i've talked about Mm -hmm. i it's kind of fallen in my list of favorite songs from this show Uh a little bit i just want to say right to shoshana then (laughs) hates move on is what she just said no i'm just joking (laughs) no 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 I I think this uh, preparing for this episode has helped me really mm-hmm. dig in. I I don't obviously I don't hate it. I no, no. I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's like my least favorite song. I mean, as I said, I I do really love the first act. I would put right a lot of the songs from the first act above this song for me personally. I think I've talked about this before when I got my very first iPhone back in two thousand and eight. There used to be this service that was not quite audiobooks but were like old radio programs you could download and it was not on apple Podcasts, so like it was Mm -hmm. was a whole different app you could download and i was obsessed because they had all these old theater radio shows that i kind of just gobbled up like interviews but also like short documentaries and stuff like that and i vividly remember i wish i could find this again and i just have never been able to (laughs) which was mandy patinkin breaking down this song oh and it was so good because it actually gave me this appreciation that I had liked this song in the past, but it made me love this song because like it starts with this phrase and then you do this and then it adds yeah. up and then you have to give this emotion right here and then it drops oh, back down. Like he literally be... went through the entire thing. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. And he performs it and it's like, wow, okay, cool that, that you're, you're able to still talk. This is like 20 years after you performed yeah. it the first time. It really broke down the song and it's like, this is how I approach this song. So that's how I got into like kind of like loving this song mm-hmm. inside of sometimes like Uber. I, I will say I am like you and that this is not my favorite song of the piece, but it probably would be near the top for me. Yeah. I want to do a couple of things here before we jump into the song. First and foremost, I want to return back to the putting it together book mm-hmm. that James Lapine brought out here last year. If people don't know, so the first act, very storied, has this workshop at Playwrights Horizons. And and they perform that pretty regularly, the first act. And this show always had a second act in mind. But again, because it's a workshop, they were trying different things and putting things there. And as far as I understand it, they did start to perform the book scenes at Playwrights Horizons before they transferred to Broadway. But they didn't have all the songs written. Um, I think... The only one that they had is It's Hot Up Here. For sure they had that, and part of putting it together Mm -hmm. had been written. Although it was called, I think, a different song at that point. Regardless, they had these kind of sketches, and then the rest of it was just book scenes. From putting it together here, uh, he writes, During the final week of rehearsal, this is now on Broadway, so they've gotten this uh, call up to Broadway very quick. They didn't think it was going to happen this quickly, but during the final week of rehearsal... Sondheim delivered the penultimate song in the second act, Move On. It was an exciting boost for Mandy and Bernadette to have this glorious and passionate number toward the end of the show. And dramatically, it was a big step in bringing our second act into focus. Yet, as the clock ticked down, there were still two songs to be completed for act two, Children in Art and Lesson Number Eight. Comforted by the fact that songs had come in quickly during our workshop, no one was particularly concerned. 
So you have to realize that a week before this literally goes live in front of people, <laughs> This is on there, he's writing three songs. And so he does move on. And then those other two songs I just mentioned are like afterwards. So this comes in very late into the process of this show, which feels weird because of how tied it feels like to the rest of the score. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because they knew he knew so much of what was already there that he could just kind of fit in yeah. this this piece. I think that is the other kind of odd thing, because the other thing that you'll find out the, the biography of Sondheim I read here last year mentioned that um, by and large, there's some exceptions in his career, but by and large, he wrote basically from the first song to the last song. Even in Merrily We Roll Along, he wrote from the first song to the last song. He didn't do it in reverse or anything like that. Uh, and in this show, it was much more organic in that he would write sometimes, you know, like the last song in Act One and then somewhere in the middle and then we, they would jump over. So he was not writing sequentially here in this case, which might be why d there is like this feeling of different songs, you know, feeling so much a part of each other because it's like, OK, well, I'm just going to take what I've already done, put it into this song and make something new. Yeah, I feel like um, it's. I was thinking about it. It's so hard to talk about one song in the show without talking about the entire show. Yes. <laughs> because everything is just like so intertwined and relating to each other. Well, to that point, this, now this is from uh, Look I Made a Hat. He sometimes writes this a little bit. He says, um, Move On is both an extension and a development of We Do Not Belong Together, which in turn is an extension and development of the lyrical section of Color and Light, the seeds of which, both musical and verbal, have been planted in the interlude of Sunday in the Park with George. They are four parts of one long musical arc, something more apparent when they are sung than on the printed page. They could be read as a mini musical of their own. Boy Loves Girl, Boy Loves Art, Boy Loses Girl, Boy gets both girl and art a hundred years later. So that's basically how he writes about how they're all kind of twined together. Yeah. I should just ask now, what is your favorite song? Okay, so I know you asked the guests like where the, each song they're talking about falls yeah. in the thing. So I went ahead and I ranked all the, oh, gosh, the songs so that I could properly answer the question. I feel like Sunday is now my favorite song oh, yeah. in, the, in the show. I just love how that works yeah like you'll people will hear this next week basically but i revisited the kind of memorial of the of the broadway singers who went to times square right after um sunday passed away and they sing sunday and there i was literally at work bawling my eyes out <laughs> listening to that <laughs> it's song it's, like, so it's so emotional. beautiful and like it's crazy i mean this is not the song we're talking about but i, I feel like i'm just in awe of any time Sondheim writes a song, I feel like someone in a tree is very similar. Yeah. Where it's like this kind of, I don't know what's happening, but I'm so moved. <laughs> and I I want to, like, it makes me want to understand, like, what's going on. I'm I, like that whole sequence. I think this is just my favorite part of the show. The whole sequence from We Do Not Belong Together to Beautiful to Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Is like, great. I'm always like, what? What is happening when like the between beautiful and Sunday when like things start to get like out of time and like people are saying weird things? We'll never I'll never see him again or or, or like mm. whatever it, things that are like what? Actually, you, you're <laughs> totally right. Like I I think that is my favorite sequence, like those three songs together. Mm -hmm. That being said, lesson number eight and to move on into the second Sunday mm. is really good too. And yes. the only reason I prefer the second Sunday, like the final closing one, mm. uh, has always been when they bow to him at the end. I, I, I for whatever reason, that moment always just like gets me. Yeah, yeah, finally yeah. Bowing to him, and then the the show basically ends. Definitely, I've, I've come around to beautiful. I keep saying this. Beautiful is like yeah. shot up in my rankings <laughs> since I, I revisited it. I was yeah, and that was one of the songs when i was a teenager that i was really into the lyrics of because i that right. pretty isn't beautiful pretty is what it changes i just i saw mm -hmm. that as like a comment on like popularity and sure. like <laughs> and so as like a teenager i was like yes like popularity fades but like what's beautiful is forever <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, for <laughs> whatever sure, for it sure. was um, do you have anything to say, I guess, about what he calls like this mini arc of like uh, Sunday in the Park with George, the opening song, mm -hmm. Color and Light, We Do Not Belong Together, Move On? Like, do you can, can you see how that tracks? Oh, yeah. Well, I was thinking it is interesting. Like when I get to uh, move on, they sing like we've always belonged together. That mm -hmm. part 
never seems to hit me the mm. way I think Sondheim intends it to. This is what I wanted to bring up. I guess we might as well just say it now rather than <laughs> like, we'll, we'll get to it, which is because we do not belong together. The song yeah. is about a relationship, yeah. romance, that sort of thing. And when they reference it in this song, like we've always belonged we've together, always belonged it's together, yeah. different. It's they're not talking about love or relationship. Right. It's basically like the the art. Like it's like um, yeah, that connection has we've always belonged together. It's more of like a intellectual thing that yes. you're like, what are you saying here? So it like doesn't hit me. And so when when I first heard Sondheim say this, that it's that's the arc, and then they come together here and emotionally, relationship wise in that way, I was like, really, that's what's <laughs> that's yeah. what's happening because I never it never hit me in that way yeah like and also like to me I know she's talking to him him as if he's George from the first act but he it it doesn't hit me that it is the same George right. <laughs> and so it's not quite but um but yeah so like if you think about that arc that you mentioned the first song the first song is really the only time you see their relationship work in the <laughs> right. show and they're not even doing anything romantic, <laughs> romantic no. or anything. But you can see, like, this is their relationship. Is she's her his model, and but it's working. Mm -hmm. Like telling her to concentrate. Yeah, like, that's and she's where we... trying. She's she's doing it. She's part of. It. She wants to get out of the dress, but she's doing it. And and then you see color and light. This is their relationship not working. They're together, Correct. but like this is their relationship. You see it not working, and at the end she leaves. So like by the third song, like they're broken up <laughs> That's right. already. And then I just think that, um, especially as in the original, how Bernadette Peters plays her, like they do, she does such a really good job. And it's in the text too, of like really showing how there was love there because you never right. actually see it play out ever. You have <laughs> to go by her reaction to losing him and his reaction to losing her. But you never see, and I you think never see the perfect. Yeah, yeah, and I think some people probably I've heard like how, that they have a problem with that because it's like, well, I don't buy them together because you never see them together. But what mm -hmm. you do see is like the reaction to not being together. Yeah, you can tell them that they deeply did love each other. Yeah, and I I totally get that at least in the first you know in the first yeah. act and over time and then so sorry then it's what comes after we do not belong together does that and then, and then it's then, this song then it's yeah so then this is like this huge jump <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to this song where you know she returns well the, the, the thing i would push back on and maybe sometime yeah. in other interviews has clarified this a little bit more and i'm, I'm open to people writing in so that we can like <laughs> have a bigger conversation about this when you say like he gets the girl and the art a hundred years later it's like mm -hmm. does he get the girl like right like he, the the, the no. ghost of, of dodd is coming back yeah. and, and giving him great advice you know it's a, re a reciprocity like he gave her great advice back in time she's now giving him good advice here in the present in the contemporary world but he doesn't like really get her he, he's not getting a girl at the end of this because she's just a she's a ghost of the past yeah i think this song is so tough in terms mm -hmm. of like like it's see in a way like i thought it like oh this is such a direct song like there's such like direct like yeah. this is what art is but then I'm thinking about it and like, no, this song is really difficult to like parse out what is like what is actually happening and what they're actually talking what they're actually sure. talking about. So I think also it works on these two levels of like specificity in general. Mm. Th this is like a very specific situation of this character of George and this character of Dot and what they're talking about relating to their own lives. Hundred percent. So to get to that like what is happening in the show like right before this song starts so they sung he sung lesson number eight which is he's reading uh the book the grammar book that comes from dot via marie he has this moment where he kind of is thinking about all those characters and all those people that she's writing about and there mm -hmm. and there's dot <laughs> 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 the the I will say the stage directions basically say like he by reading the grammar book it invokes the spirit of dot to come on stage I think is mm -hmm. what it says something something to that effect yeah and this is like they're in Paris he's on the island his mm -hmm. assistant has just said he's leaving to go work at NASA so all that's happened and he's in this kind of 
state of like he's basically already decided that he has to move on to something new like that's kind mm-hmm. of been decided but this so then i see this song as like the how how does one do that what do i what's the blueprint for <laughs> for moving on because yeah, i already no, 100%. i already know i have to yeah let's number eight is him coming to the conclusion like i have to move on right and now this is him actually doing that yeah but but <laughs> or at least how? the first steps right. <laughs> yeah so this is this is the thing i'm now going to bring up that i said uh, before we started recording that uh, i'm going to spring on you oh good lapine has a bit of a template that he likes to work from because uh this and in into the woods basically the penultimate song is a ghost of a woman who comes back to tell the man what to do <laughs> like i don't know it's a it's a bit of a calling card let's just say for for lapine to work this into his shows yeah that um at least in into the woods it's one of many other things that are happening, that are happening. in that last thing but no 100 this is like yeah this is the big one at, at least and at least in this the woman has lived a full life <laughs> <laughs> yeah and wasn't Filled off unnecessarily, but anyway. Here's how the song begins here. George says, I've nothing to say. And Dot says, you have many things. Well, nothing that's not been said. Said by you, though, George. I do not know where to go, and nor did I. I want to make things that count. Things that will be new. I did what I had to I do. To what say. am I to do? Move well, on. Nothing that's not been said. Said by you, I do George. not know where to go. And nor did I. I want to make things that count. Things that will I be I did new. what I had to do. What am I to do? Move on. Stop worrying where you're going. Move this is part of like the straightforwardness of the song that I mm-hmm. think I was talking about before. Because so much of this show is very like poetic and half sentences and Mm -hmm. and all that and then we get to act two where things are a lot more contemporary and direct and i think this is how this starts but then i think also it's showing like this song is about a very specific two very specific situations where Mm -hmm. dot is talking about so is she, she talking about her decision to leave george I believe so, yes. Okay. I was going to ask the same question to you here, but like uh, they are somewhat talking past each other just in this first bit. I, I do think George is kind of hearing her, but like, you know, I have nothing to say. You have many things. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, nothing that's not been said, but he's like, you know, you haven't said this yet, George. And then they start talking back and forth. If we, sorry, if we just read the George stuff, I don't know where to go. I want to make things that count, things that will be new. What am I to do? That could all be said at one time without right. interjections. But Dodd is saying, it's like, well, I didn't know what to do either. I did what I had to do, and I moved on. Moved on from you specifically, and also physically, because I moved on to a different country. Right. And I think, so that's why I think, like, she could be referencing, I mean, she could be referencing both, but she mm-hmm. she made two decisions, basically. She made the decision to leave George, and she made the decision to be with Louis and and the decision to go to, to America with Louis. That's right. So she could be referencing any any of those, I guess, in this. So I think it becomes a little bit clearer here because Dot continues on. This is all her. Stop worrying where you're going. Move on. If you can know where you're going, you've gone. You just keep moving on. I chose and my world was shaken. So what? The choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was Stop not. You have to move on. Move on. If you can know where you're going, you've gone. Just keep moving on. I chose and my world was shaken, so what? The choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was not. You have to move on. Okay, so I think my least favorite lines in this song are the stop worrying where you're going, move on. If you know where you're going, you've gone. Because they're, I mean, worrying, obviously, you don't want to worry. You don't want to be worrying. But I think, and I think this gets into like thinking about this song as something more general that like I'm taking from it as if they're talking to me. (laughs) Like stop worrying where you're going. That part always takes me aback like well i should 
like, do you, what do you mean? Do you mean I shouldn't, that I should just move from one thing to another without thinking about it just as long as I'm moving on? Like, should I, shouldn't I put thought, <laughs> should I put thought into how I'm moving, you know, stuff like that. So I think that takes me aback. Yeah, I get that. I think how I have always taken this is a bit of a different mm -hmm. uh, interpretation where it, I, I don't think that she's advising him just to haphazardly make choices. I think she's yeah. still telling him to make very specific choices. Um, and we get into that a little bit later in the song here where it's like, what is it you want? Then move towards it. Stop like sitting here and fretting and worrying about like mm -hmm. what is happening right now to you. If we take it like very literally in the show, George is like, well, I have to keep making chromolooms. Like that's the only thing I can do. That's the only thing I've been you know, making money on. And what I'm known for is making these chromolooms. And basically everyone in his life is also telling him, is like, I think it's time to stop making chromolooms. <laughs> I, think, I think you've done all you can making this he's not happy the, the the critics aren't happy the fans aren't really all that happy with what he what he's making anymore so it's time to like pick a direction and kind of go on yeah. to the next thing so it's intentional you want to be intentional with, with right. where you're going and then kind of make that choice for me uh talking about like your least favorite lyrics my favorite <laughs> lyrics in this song or what ha or what she says next which is yeah the choice may have been mistaken but the choosing was not it's like yeah you can't live your life being afraid to make the wrong choice you're going to at some point right Just, like back the wrong horse or like make the wrong investment or you know jump in with both feet when you shouldn't have it wasn't the mistake of making the choice it was uh, the mistake of because uh, you, you don't want to stay stagnant or you don't want to stay in one place too right. long sort of thing. And that makes me wonder, like, and then this is getting into, like, is she talking about herself here? Like, right. does she think one of her choices was mistaken right, with that yeah. line? Is she saying, I, I did this, the choice may have been mistaken, or is it like... Just a general, like, you make a choice and maybe it's mistaken, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, reading into the dot stuff, I mean, a lot of this is like, you know, textual analysis. I don't know how much you would be able to perform this on stage necessarily. Mm -hmm. But the way I read this too is like, is she like in love with Louis? Probably mm -hmm. not. Right. But choosing to go with him, going to America, having a fairly secure life apparently working in the follies um <laughs> at, at some point in her life was that choice the best she ever made being with this man she doesn't love probably not but it did afford her other things that she could do that she did right. have a uh, greatness with so again yeah. it's it's not worrying about the past or the bad choice it's like okay because uh, i can't change the past there's no there's no sense being mad at what you did in the past it's already happened so you have to go on to the next thing yeah if you can know where you're going, you've gone. This line always trips me up. Oh, yeah. What? So <laughs> I think I'm just getting lost in like the syntax sure. of it. How do you interpret this line? Maybe this is because I am a person who has always lived in a constant uh, in a constant reality of being like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I really mm -hmm. don't know what I'm doing most of the time. And the only time I'm really sure like, OK, this is what I'm doing today or next week or whatever is literally when I have made the decision, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I don't really have like necessarily like those long term goals of like or, or fret around like, oh, what am I going to do next or well, what's going to happen next? It's like, OK, I don't know to put it into like this this show, for instance, I basically kept going to the iTunes store and being like, someone must have made a Sondheim podcast by now, right? Like someone had to have done that by now. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Didn't happen. And then finally, <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. Did I know how to do it? No. Did I have the best idea in the world? Probably not. But I made the decision and choice to kind of go forward and kind of willed it into existence. And I think really what this ties into is like the only time you're like 100% sure of what your destination, what your path in life is, is after you've made the choice of like, okay, yeah. I'm going to apply for this job or I'm going to you know, go introduce myself to this person or I'm going to move to this city. Once you've done that, you've made the choice and now you can meet the challenges that come at you. That's how I read it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I guess we kind of talked about this, but the, the the line that actually causes me only slight confusion uh -huh. is I chose and my world was shaken. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is she referring to in this? Is is right. that her again? Is that her breaking up with George? Yeah, I think it is. But like, I don't know that 100 percent. Yeah, because I think I always thought about it as like if if I were going to tie it to one of her choices, it was to move. It was the moving. But it seems more likely that she'd be talking about 
breaking up, like leaving him. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So she continues on by going, look at what you want, not at where you are, not at what you'll be. Look at all the things you've done for me. Opened up my eyes, taught me how to see, notice every tree. And George repeats, notice every tree, understand the light. And George repeats, understand the light, concentrate on now. And then George says, I want to move on. I want to explore the light. I want to know how to get through, through to something new, something of my own. And they both come together, move on, move on. Not at what you'll be. Look at all the things you've done for me. Opened up my eyes. Taught me how to see. Notice every tree. Notice every tree. Understand the light. Understand the light. Concentrate I on the I want to explore the light. I want to know how to get through, through to something new, something of my own. Move on, move on. The story you give your vision is new. Yeah, I feel like this is now where we're getting into like, this is this is how you move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is what you need to do is what you showed me all this stuff or what I got from your command to concentrate was all this. So now I'm going to give this to you. This is how this is how you get back to yourself as an artist. Because what I think is going on for George is he's trying to he's become such a business person, which is sure. like what happens when a lot of times when you have to when you're responsible for getting your own art to, right. you know produce which you know is is the whole putting it together song that sure. he went through he's and i think he's just in a spot where he's just so in that process of like i know how to make a chroma loom because i know how to get the money for that because that's what people are will pay me for right um to do I think about that line now. I'm again referencing other other songs <laughs> in the in the show, but I think about that line at the start of putting it together, where he says, "You know what's in the room? Another chroma loom." The first time I heard that line, I thought I actually thought of it as like the way George from the first act goes to the park and says, "Like you know what's in this park? Another painting." Oh yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And like, but that's not how George of Second Act is thinking about it. Obviously, he's saying, you know, what's in the room, the money for my next chroma. Yeah, loop. almost you begrudgingly. Know? What it like what he's trying to get back to, or get to is first act George's mentality of like, you know, what's in this room, the art of my neck, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I will see this room the way George saw that park, you yeah. know, like going there and seeing the art in within that space well the other thing too that i find slightly comedic about this song not that like i think it's trying to be comedic but the, the the funny thing to me is that so what george taught her was to concentrate and be still and what mm -hmm. she's telling him to do is to move <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like the two two opposites right and i think that that is where some of the complexity of this song is because i think yeah. sometimes dot is singing to herself and sometimes she's singing to george right because right when she says concentrate on now, that's what she learned. She she learned how to concentrate on right. now. She's not telling him to do that because she says earlier, don't look at where you are, right? You have to keep moving forward. So I think if if you, you can trip yourself up here and be like, isn't she saying two separate things? But part of it she's singing yeah. to herself and part of it she's singing to George. Well, I think also it's like this is George never said to her, George at first act, never said to her all this stuff. He just mm -hmm. told her to concentrate. And she kind of realized all all of this from her observations of how he worked at right. later when she thought about it or what however it was like we never we never see him say this to her and we That's never right. really see her realize it in the first act she just it's kind of like she just comes and tells us this. <laughs> <laughs> right, tells right, us right. this now but it's something she's thought about i guess and i'm so curious as, as to what what george is going to move on to like that's also something we never really see in this show like what is his next thing what is the non chromalone that he goes to create because here he's saying like i want to explore the light 
Yeah. I want to know how to get through, through to something new. I want to know what that is. I want to know what that actually means to them. How do you explore the light without a light projector? Or maybe it is, but something that I'm not even thinking about. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he, he definitely doesn't really know at this point. Right. What that is. He's still like in the process of what this, this kind of mindfulness meditation <laughs> that she's t- <laughs> taking right, it right. on. But I, I feel like she's kind of like breaking him down to be able to get in that headspace yeah that is true because literally she comes in here next because he's like i want to you know get to through the, through to something new but dot says stop worrying if your vision is new let others make right. that decision they usually do you keep moving on and then they kind of sing over top of each other here so dot is saying look at what you've done then at what you want not at where you are what you'll be Look at all the things you gave to me. Let me give you something in return. I would be so pleased. George is singing something in the light, something in the sky, in the grass, up behind the trees. Things I hadn't looked at till now. Flower in your hat and your smile. And then George continues. And the color of your hair. And the way you catch the light. And the care. And the feeling. And the life. Moving on. And then Dot says, we've always belonged together. And they both come together saying, we will always belong together. Stop worrying if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. Keep moving on. Look at what you've done. Something in the light, Look something in the sky, where the grass, but you'll behind be. the trees. Look at all the things you gave to things me. I hadn't looked at till now. Flowers in your in hat return. and your smile. I would be so clear. section but how do we take any of this yeah wow this is a lot (laughs) so i think this brings up a lot of things one yeah the what is what is newness you know what is that idea yeah and how it relates to other people because she say well actually don't worry about the new whether it's new or not i mean i think this is a universal artist (laughs) question of like trying to get trying to create something new i do remember Somebody said in grad school, just like, good is always new, which I thought was nice. Um, <laughs> right. Just a nice way to not, wor- to not worry about whether something is new, to just make it good. Yeah, and the whole let others make that decision. That almost feels like a, a dig <laughs> at uh, critics here. Yeah, and, and I, we, I, we talked about it in the uh, putting it together episode. There's a part that I want to be perfectly honest, I've never really heard because it's during part of the overlap singing yeah which basically has this that play out which is a group of people making up their minds about the art that they're seeing <laughs> about whether yeah. it's good or not they're gonna say if it's good or not you, you don't have to necessarily worry about that you just have to keep working at what inspires you that sort of thing what do you think about the word usually in this lyric mm. I only ask you this because Sondheim writes like 10 paragraphs about how he hates the fact that he had to use that word uh, I was going to say, I, I haven't seen him write that, but I was going to say it does feel like a filler word. But <laughs> mm-hmm. Basically, so I, I'm not going to read the whole thing here. The word I want to use is eventually. But what do I do about uh. the extra first syllable? The musical pattern has been set by the matching phrase, the choosing was not in the preceding equivalent stanza. And then he goes on, but like, I could have done all these other things, but decided not to. I, I just had to use a word there. Uh, there was three syllables and usually was the thing I put into there, but it doesn't quite match what he's trying to communicate within the song. It's unfortunate when those things happen, I think, mm-hmm. because you really, really want to go for the actual meaning of it. I do love, though, how Bernadette Peters sings that usually. Yeah, I <laughs> so, know. <laughs> so at least it, it was good for something. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, what is you, uh, you, it kind of looks like it means like some 
sometimes they do. <laughs> I, I have to say, though, I kind of like it. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm so used to that being the word in this song. It feels like more of a dig, like you said, to critics in this case, okay. instead of they eventually do, which is more, I don't know, looking into the future. I don't know. I, yeah, it just, I, I get that that's the word he wanted to use, but I guess uh, usually has always worked for me really well there. The thing about the overlapping in this section here, though, that I really keyed in in uh, this past week listening to it, I think the biggest thing about contemporary George, as opposed to George Seurat, George Seurat was always looking at the individual bits and putting it together inside of his painting. Mm -hmm. He was going and finding yeah. disparate things. And George here is not. He actually has a hard time. He's really focused on one thing without being able to see like the whole together. And so mm -hmm. you can hear it between this. It's like, oh my gosh, like there's the light, the sky, the grass, things I hadn't seen until now, until you let me stop, look at it. And now I'm actually noticing things I hadn't seen here before. So it's him coming back to, uh, I guess, his family tree. Yeah. I mean, there's also the whole theme of legacy mm -hmm. throughout this song, too. I mean, throughout the show, but also culminating in this song as well. Like, this is what's being passed down. These right. these, ba these values, these ideas, these, uh, you know, what George did, what Dot thought, you know, is being passed down which is also a big theme of the show. Yeah, I, maybe that's partly how we're supposed to read this here too, which is like the we've always belonged together, we will always belong together is him fully coming like, you know what? I am accepting that George Seurat was my, you know, mm -hmm. is inside my family tree, which I've been rejecting for all, for the for the entirety of Act 2. We do belong together. This is part of my family tree. You're right. intrinsically linked to me, even though I never really met you. Your image will stay with me. And now... Uh, I've accepted that, and now I can now move on and make my next great thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a really great way of of looking at it. I mean, because there is the whole children and art song about what to leave behind, and he mm -hmm. doesn't have children. Sondheim never had children. Correct. So I think that's probably on his mind. Again, don't want to psychoanalyze him too much, but from... <laughs> Reports are read. I, I don't want to mischaracterize him, but from what I understand, there was a period of his life uh, where he was kind of disappointed that he never did have kids. Like that was something that he wanted. Yeah, there's a line in um, Sondheim on Sondheim, that mm. show, where there's an interview, I think, where he yeah. says, yeah, I'm disappointed or sad that I never had children. It feels right to me that that's on his, on his mind. Sure. You know, in this show. In his life. Which is also interesting that Into the Woods then is the next show, which has very yeah. much to do with like families and children. Well, and also the show before this, um, That's true. Marley, yeah. was the whole impetus for the show was young people. Yeah. For that show was young people. But yeah, so it's like the idea of like, if you're not going to have children, well, then what, how do you, how do you think about legacy? How do, right. you, how do you think about continuing the line? That, that phrase, which is very yeah. potent. <laughs> In, especially for women no, but for sure. um yeah because obviously marie is that like she says like i want i want you to have children george i want yeah. i want you to continue the line but but if you not everybody has children so i was gonna say some of us have mothers that remind us of this all the time <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah yeah <laughs> um part of being in the world i think is thinking about what your legacy is going to be well i mean and, and that's how this song wraps up here which I really love the final, uh, I guess these are five lines of this song, which is mm -hmm. just keep moving on. This is Dot singing. Just keep moving on. Anything you do, let it come from you. Then it will be new. Give us more to see. I mean, I think I think these are great lines. When when I was I definitely when I was in high school, these lines really hit me mm -hmm. hard. That's a really succinct way to sum up what she wants for him to do, what he's going what he needs to do, what he should do. Mm -hmm. And into like this beautiful 
little adage of a lyric. Yeah, I think this is like the simplicity of song time coming into focus here too, because I think it's, again, very particular words he's using here, right? Anything you do, let it come from you. Like just don't create something just to create, because if you do that, then it's going to be new. And we want more of that. Like, like we give us more to see, which is, I mean, again, to put it into the real world is, uh, I'm sure something that Sondheim believed about his favorite artists. And I think is what like huge Sondheim fans thought about him uh as well like oh we want to see what the new song time show is right um and i have tickets to his last show in new york city so like <laughs> it's <laughs> i'm gonna get to see like something new from him one yeah. last time yeah and i think it ans- it's trying to answer the question of what is newness that mm-hmm. i was saying before like how do you create something new mm-hmm. well it has to it has to come from you and if that then i mean that's what it says that it's new yeah, yeah. so it's that's I, I think because I as I said, like, I think a lot of this song is like, well, how do I do it yeah. well, here? <laughs> and this is I'm telling you is, how to do it. Yeah, I think this is how Sondheim finishes the entire chapter of Sunday in the Park with George with these two paragraphs, which is the next to last lines express something I firmly believe, but find it increasingly hard to act on. I used it as a supportive thought when I hit those low moments of taking on the fraudulence of what I'm writing, moments which occur with increasing frequency the older I get. It's a weak mantra, but one worth repeating as often as possible. The last line of Move On demonstrates that sometimes it's a good idea not to rhyme, even when the music calls for it. With the possible exception of the last line of Four Black Dragons, this one is my favorite. I like how self-deprecating it is at times, but I don't know if it is a weak mantra. I, I think I disagree with him and that uh, let it come from you, then it will be new is a weak mantra. I think that that's uh, actually resonant in its simplicity. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't think, again, like how it is kind of, I mean, I a lot of what I kind of don't love about this song is that it does kind of come off a little self-helpy at times. Sure. And, but if if you think about it in that kind of general way, and I wonder if that's that's part <laughs> of what he's maybe responding to in it. But um, <laughs> that's why the subtitle is the power of positive thinking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think that those lines are are at least even if they are a little self-helpy, at mm-hmm. least like very clear. Yeah. And very emotional for people and powerful for people who may be stuck. But you could say that about any self-help thing that helps people, I guess. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, we kind of talked about it um, out of order here. But I mean, <laughs> if um, if you take a look at the entire score, like where would this song like rate for you would it be top three middle three bottom three like maybe you could just give your all your ratings from bottom Uh, to top and then we'll know yeah so as i said i ranked i i mean the rankings themselves aren't quite like this could move here this could move like one up Mm -hmm. one down here you know but but i really was curious like where move on would fall and all this so it falls at the either the bottom of the first third or the mm-hmm. top of the second third, depending <laughs> on like how I right. move, move things around. Because as I said, that we do not belong together, beautiful Sunday, like that's my top. Yeah, that's yeah. my top part of the show. I love it. I also really love color and light. Mm-hmm. I think that's an amazing number. I really rank up high. It's hot up here. <laughs> People would be like, why are you ranking that above move on? But I, but I, find myself singing that song all the time definitely in the summer months i've been singing it a lot more it's like yeah this is, it's this is uncomfortable but it's so fun it's just like a fun song to sing too that da, 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 yeah the little staccato da, 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 da. parts the of that staccato. are so good yeah it's so good yeah i think it's a really fun song i'm ranking it up that high all right and, uh, yeah i don't uh, know I, I never did like an official rating i feel I still think it would probably be in my top five. I'm going to guess it would be somewhere yeah. in the top five. Like I said, it's not my top, top favorite, but it's uh, it, it's definitely up there. Um, and yeah. there's, a gr- there's a lot of great interpretation of this song that you can find online. Yeah. I mean, musically, it's, it's beautiful mm-hmm. when the two voices come, come together, together and yeah. they're singing in harmony like that. I mean, it's just gorgeous with mm-hmm. his, his tenor voice on the top. Like, yeah, yeah. it's... You can't- it's that. Great. Um, as kind of a wrap up here, then Shoshana, um, this show, of course, is based on a painting, which is a little bit 
something that's a little bit odd to make a show out of. I wonder if there is something that uh, you think is also odd that you think could be turned into a musical. Yes, I do. And that <laughs> is the traffic light. And let me tell you how this is going to work. I will, that... <laughs> yes, strap in, everyone. <laughs> so the traffic light, the one we're used to today with the three lights, was mm -hmm. invented by this really cool inventor named Garrett Morgan, who was a Black American inventor, businessman, and community leader in uh, the later half, latter half of the 19th century into the early 20th century. He's a really cool guy. Um, definitely look him up, Garrett mm -hmm. Morgan. And I think that he would make a, it would make a cool musical about his life. He was invented a lot of things, but the traffic light is one we use today that is pretty special because it saves all our lives all yeah. the time. And the opening song would be called Wait, Stop, Go. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has like this built in yeah. um, rhythm of the lights. It has... Yeah, like it has uh, just the idea of like, yeah, like when people stop, when they go, when they slow mm -hmm. down. Like, <laughs> I think there's I like a lot. That, I think there's a lot That's there. <laughs> no, I love that. That's so cool. I like. <laughs> I've been loving everybody's uh, responses to this, so this has been really fun. Yeah, and I have one more story that I want to tell. Do if it. We have time. Oh, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So I used to volunteer usher at theaters in New York, and I always wanted to seat Sondheim. That was mm. like. I got really close once. I saw him. He was in the theater, but he went in the other door. Right. So I had this whole scenario in my head where I would say, because I always ask people when I they came up to me, like, do you know where you're headed? Mm -hmm. And they would to see it to for some people, they just like want to go to their seats. Yeah, so yeah. the scenario in my head that I would say, do you know where you're headed? And he would say, it doesn't matter where I'm headed as long as I'm moving on. <laughs> and I real I was like, this is going to happen. So finally... 2019 slave play at New York Theater Workshop. Right, yeah. He comes to my door. I'm like, this is it. So I say, do you know where you're headed? And he says, tell us. And that was uh, it. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. That I love was that. my <laughs> one interaction with Sondheim in my entire life, one on one. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool i have um again heard through the grapevine that he was a great audience member because he laughed when there was jokes <laughs> he would clap and cry and he would do all the stuff for just to engage with the with the piece that was in front of him and going to plays like up until like the final week of him passing away like he went to like two new plays apparently like the week before yeah i mean this was slave play this was not like a typical just like musical theater right. <laughs> It's, you know. Uh, Shoshana, if people wanted to uh, keep up with you, see what you're doing online, what's the easiest way for them to do so? Yeah, well, I have a website, shoshanagreenberg.com. You can just find me there, Basecamp. And uh, I also have a an Instagram, Shoshana Creates. I am still on Twitter or whatever it's X called now. now. Yeah. yeah, whatever that is. V Marshmallow, uh, M E L L O is the end of that spelling. And uh, I have my podcast, Scene to Song, and that is also on all the social media platforms, I guess, the big ones anyway. That's where you can find me online. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, this was really fun. I'm really glad that I got to talk about this song even though it's not my favorite song but it is my favorite show so i was here for it oh yeah <laughs> it was it went well it was perfect Thanks so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. This is an independent production, and you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Putting It Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we're going to be talking about the song Sunday. I'm going to be sitting by the triangular water. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now.